not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly place. At any rate, uh, we welcome you, welcome everybody here. Dealing with the devil, part three. This is the first time in my ministry that I'm having a four-part series. This is the third part. A four-part series. I could have done it many times, but I, I usually didn't break it up. I just kept preaching. Uh, but we're not going to do that on this one. It's, it's, it's uh, a lot of information, a lot of things about dealing with the devil. Today's topic is going to be to capture a man. Now when I say man, it's, by, it's gender. Man or woman. He doesn't care who it is, right? Uh, if he captures them. But to capture a man, uh, the story is told of Dr. William Culbertson and Irwin Moon. They actually were part of the Moody Bible Institute. They landed their private plane over in a small African country. They were going to try to visit a mission station that was there. The next morning, they arrived back at the airstrip to find out that it had been surrounded by barbed wire and machine guns. Now, during the night, the communists had seized control and power by taking control of the radio station, the transportation facility, and only quick thinking and quick diplomacy allowed these men to get away safely in their airplane. So a tiny nation went to bed free. They woke up the next morning under communist control. Yet the communists knew that military force does not really control men. The Berlin Wall, for example, it restricted travel. You could not travel, but it did not make communists out of people. The only way to capture a man or a woman is to get them to think like you do. Right. Ideas change men, not weapons. You win a man's mind and you have it. You capture his thoughts and you control him. Does not the wisdom of the Holy Spirit teach us in Proverbs 23 verse 7, you don't have to turn there. The Bible says, as a man thinketh in his what? Heart. So is he. Now your heart and your mind are synonymous. Look that word up. Synonymous. It means they're almost the same. So if you can find a way to get your ideas inside of someone else so that he thinks as you do, then you gain that man. Man is the product of his thinking. And when other countries take prisoners, why do they try to brainwash their prisoners? It also explains their passion for propaganda. They flood the world with their literature, do they not? Uh, they, they get out as much of their thinking as they can. Now, Paul feared Satan as an attacker of our mind. Come with me to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3. Paul has a lot to say about this subject. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3. Notice what he says, But I fear, least by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind shall be corrupted with the simplicity that is in Christ. You know, that's clear. Paul knew of Satan's crafty ability to lead Christians from pure devotion to Jesus Christ. Are we not to become like who? Christ. Jesus. We're to be like Him. And all the devil, uh, the evil one, really need do is reach into the mind with his corrupted suggestion and we bend to his will. Now the subtlety which beguiled Eve, the Bible says, is just as mighty today on your knees. The devil manipulates the minds of God's people with surprising ease. Have you ever wondered why you cannot remember scripture passages quite as well as you would like to? Or why your mind sometimes wanders at prayer time? 
Or when you're in prayer fellowship with others, you find it difficult to remain in focus with them. Has somebody been praying and you're thinking about everything else? Satan is responsible. Christians have badly underestimated him at this point. The undisciplined mind is wide open to satanic attack. If you do not conscientiously control every thought going through your head, and who does, the resulting slackness makes it easy then for Satan to introduce his own idea into your brain, into your mind. You're not aware that he does this, for the thoughts appear as if they're your own thoughts. You say to me, you say, Tommy, how can I control every thought of my life? And I answer back to you, if you don't, a mastermind is ready to control it for you. If we are careless about God's word, as a man thinketh in his heart, the Bible says, so what? So is he. Satan is not careless. He is not careless. He counts on it, and he puts it to work for himself, and undisciplined thought life makes one vulnerable to the devil. It takes very little to get a man to think as Satan does. If you think I'm being unreasonable this morning to suggest the complete discipline of your mind, the Apostle Paul is even more definite on the subject. Let's go back to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. We're going to look at verses 4 and 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5. The Bible says, Paul speaking, for the weapons of our what? Warfare. Warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every what? Every thought to what? The obedience of Christ. There it is. Notice every thought. Beloved, thinking is a contest. If you don't believe it, try to keep your mind on Jesus Christ for five solid minutes. You'll find a, a, a state of warfare exists, a thought war. It reminds me of, uh, I like Andy Griffith. And Andy took Barney, uh, not Barney, he took Gomer over to the, to the uh, Marines. You may have watched that episode. And uh, Andy dropped him off, and he, he got to thinking badly because Gomer wasn't the brightest apple, you know what I'm saying? And so he goes to the barracks, and Gomer's on the bed with a bucket over his head. You remember that? And uh, Andy said, Gomer, what are you doing? Gomer said, Andy, I'm just thinking, thinking, thinking. <laughs> he said, you wouldn't believe how you can think with a bucket on your head. <laughs> now, I don't know if that's true or not. If you want to try it, you can go home and put a bucket over your head and try to think. But let's turn back to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Our scripture reading this morning, we've been, we've been going through this uh, the last several Sabbaths, Ephesians 6 verse 12. Ephesians 6 verse 12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against what kind? Spirit. Spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, evil strongholds are maintained for the purpose of clouding our minds. Spiritual forces are ready to keep us from dwelling our minds with Jesus Christ. Dignitaries make it their business to keep us from setting our affections on things that are above. The resources of spiritual wickedness are organized to make us forget Jesus Christ most of the day. So again, try bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And see if it doesn't amount to a military campaign. 
The Holy Spirit warns us of a mental weariness in devoting ourselves to Jesus. Turn with me to Hebrews. To the book of Hebrews, chapter 12. Hebrews, chapter 12, we're going to look at verse 3. Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 3. Notice what he said. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be weary and faint where? In your mind. See, beloved, the battlefield is the thought life of the Christian. Spiritual war is a real war. Let's look now at the equipment the Apostle Paul cites as the Christian armor. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. The book of Ephesians chapter 6. And let's look at verses. We're going to read verses 13 to 18. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13 to 18. It says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole arm of God, that ye may be able to withstand an evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the who? The wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Observe now that it's all mental preparation. It's all mental preparation. If Satan's lordship over humanity is maintained by his control of the thought life, then Christian victory surely rests in the area of the disciplined mind. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Philippians 2, verse 5 tells us, Let this what? Mind be in you, which was also in who? By Jesus. Beloved, this is a thought war strategy. Thus, the mind of man is the focus of satanic operation. To the extent to which he can influence the thoughts of people, it's the extent to which he can control them. Did you get that? Did you hear that? Amen. Let's look now at Satan's personal attack. To be a personal adversary, Satan has to be present to each Christian. Now that raises a theological question here this morning. Is Satan omnipresent? You know what the word means. He can be everywhere at one time. Uh, and that is, can he be in every place at one time? Well, if he is to be present in every Christian, he has to be in more place than one place at a time. So we need to discuss here this morning his ability to press a full-scale attack personally against every child of God. The scriptures teach for us that Satan is viewed as a present spirit who deals personally with individuals. Let's turn back to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 3 and 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, I mean chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. Verse 3, But if our gospel, he says, be hid, it is hid to them that are what? That are lost. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the what? The minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine into them. Amazing. Matthew. Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, verse 19. Matthew chapter 13, verse 19. And we're going to read there now verse 19. And this is the parable of the seed sower. But let's look at Matthew 13, verse 19. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the who? The wicked one. 
and catcheth away that which was sown in his what? Heart. Heart. This is he which received seed by the wayside. Now that sounds pretty personal to me, does it not to you? I have read discussions of how uh, underlings of the fallen angels could do this for Satan. But the construction in that verse seems to be more forced than seeing Satan is doing it himself. The Bible says, resist the devil, not demons, and he, not they, will flee from you. In our day, the idea of presence is not so hard for us to understand. Not since the advent of television. Now we have the internet, uh, all kinds of ways that we can communicate today. YouTube, Facebook, Twitter. Don't try to, try, try to Twitter me. See, that's a tongue twister. <laughs> don't try to Twitter me. I don't have Twitter. I have enough problem with, with uh, just what I got. So, I, and that's why I'm so thankful for Jose. He just got that, God gave him that part of his brain to be able to figure all this out. Now, you take the Super Bowl. Now, millions and millions of people, they're able to watch at the very same time the game with all the commercials, the halftime show, all the comments that are made, all the events that go along with this show. Now, the people saw all the action as it happens at the same time. They become involved in all the play, and they're caught up in the thrill of the moment. Now this modern miracle helps us to understand how Satan can simulate the working of the Holy Spirit to bring the present, his presence, to each life. A scene takes place in a studio by means of carrier waves. These scenes are broadcast all over the place. The waves are then picked up by these individual television sets and they play back as a picture on the screen. Now the very same picture that appears on the TV in the home is a duplicate of the one in the studio. And there is no limit to the number of television sets which can tune in to that station and get the very same picture. Therefore, if men can design TV equipment to bring in the presence of personality into our home, Surely, beloved, Satan, with all his spiritual resources, can bring his presence into our life. Don't you think it would be easier for him, as the prince of the power of the air, to do this in the spirit world Amen. than for men with circuits and transistors in the physical world? Amen. To insist that Satan cannot be in more than one place at a time Amen. is to place a limitation on him, now being outpaced by men himself. Amen. Television may be a clumsy little illustration, human illustration, but beloved, it helps us to understand Satan's presence in our life. Mm. If finite men can infinitely reproduce their presence in homes, how much easier must it be for the God of this world to bring his presence to you and me? Amen. Every day. Amen. I feel it risky to assume that our enemy is anything but present. Mm -hmm. And please note that I have not said that he's omnipresent, only that he's present. Sometimes I don't know how he can be at your house, because he's at my house all the time. <laughs> when the apostle declares Satan, he says he's the God of this world, he awards him theological authority. He also calls him the prince of this world, ascribing political authority over mankind. But when he dubs him the prince of the power of the air, it is a description of his spiritual dominion as the unholy spirit and his power to do his work inside of people. Turn back to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And we're going to look at verse 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. Notice what the Bible says. Verse 2. Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in who? The children of disobedience. 
And he tries to get those that are following Jesus. Disregard now for a moment that this refers to the unsaved people. See how Satan governed mankind to, as the whole, uh, uh, you have the Holy Spirit and he is the unholy spirit. What kind of a prince can do this? Here's a fantastic mystery, beloved, of free souls. The prince of the power of the air worketh inside of people. The force of the passage rests on that word worketh. And it is identical to the one that is used where God's indwelling is stated in Philippians 2 verse 13. Turn with me to Philippians 2 verse 13. It's just a few pages forward. Philippians chapter 2 verse 13. Philippians 2 verse 13 says, For it is God which what? Worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So Satan works, beloved, in people the very same way. And I can really see now no difference in the way that the God of heaven and the God of this world carried out their respective ambitions in the hearts of men. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 11. The Bible tells us, 1 Corinthians 12, 11, but all these worketh that one in the self-same spirit dividing to every man severally as he will. So, Satan does the very same thing. Isn't he the, what is he called? The counterfeiter. For every truth God has, Satan has a what? A counterfeit. Satan does the same thing. By his spirit or his presence actually, he worketh in people so that they will walk according to his will. Satan works out his will in men today just as God works out his will in those who will let him. Now don't be offended here this morning that I use what you know of, the Holy Spirit operation as a counterfeit plan the devil uses to influence and maneuver people after his will. He is a God, the Bible says. He operates in the Spirit. He beholds all the Spirit of God and what God does in us, and he has the ability to counterfeit, if not duplicate it. Well. Always to serve his evil purposes, and that is what he wants to do. It's my conviction here this morning concerning Satan's presence that makes me respect him as my personal enemy. I don't know if you've had to ever deal with the devil. If you haven't, then more praise God. But I don't imagine that anybody in this room, other that even little kids are being programmed. Isn't that right? Yes, they are. You know, when I do dedication, child dedication, I, I don't just specifically dedicate the children. You got to dedicate the parents too. Because yeah. if the parents aren't going to raise the child in the way they should go, yeah. pretty soon they're going to be just like the parents. Isn't that right? Now, he wants to serve his evil purposes. We want to look now how Satan does that, how Satan sees. Turn with me to Hebrews 4, verse 13. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 13. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13. And by the way, we have uh, David and, and Bernice, we have a rule here at this church, and all I do is the first time they're here, they eat first. So uh, if I go a little bit longer, you don't have to worry. You're gonna get you're gonna get up first. So Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. But how many? Oh. All things are naked and open to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Now this passage speaks of God's all-seeing eye, but the same thing can be said of the God of this world. He counterfeits everything God has. So the other ruler of mankind does not miss anything either. Now, let's consider again how hearts are exposed to his evil gaze. Matthew 13. Turn back with me to Matthew. Matthew chapter 13. 
Matthew chapter 13, verse 19, the parable of the sower, seed sower. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 19. Matthew 13, verse 19, the Bible said, Jesus speaking, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and understands it not, then uh, cometh the wicked one or the devil and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received the seed by the wayside. So can you picture now what it takes to do that? Not only does the wicked one have to be present, but he also has to know what is going on in the understanding of the listener to be able to know if he needs to snatch it or not, right? So notice these words. It said, understand it not. What does a person have to stand to behold the reasoning of another person? What ability is required to do that? And by the way, I don't believe in clairvoyance and all of these. Don't go to a psychic to find, let them tell you where you lost something, something like that. No. No horoscopes. Huh? No horoscopes. No horoscopes either. Amen. That's the devil. Amen. Just using those people. Uh, he can use those people, but what ability is required? Why the heart and mind of the reasoner must be exposed to Satan's view. If he can snatch it out of our heart when we get it, does he read our, our minds and our hearts? According to the Bible, yes. He can read what's in our heart. He can read what's in our mind. Uh, that's why we need to guard our heart. We need to guard our mind. How do we do that? With the Word of God, by fortifying our mind with God's Word Amen. and uh, keeping it there. How does Satan know that someone doesn't understand the Gospel unless he beholds the very thought? He has to see them. That means then that the whole mental experience is laid bare before him. Now, then see that as only part of Satan's ability. On top of that, he has the power, the Bible says, to take the truth away. Jesus said so. He can snap the Word of God right out of a man's heart. Now we're going to see later on that how he does that. But for right now, we're going to close and that will be part three.